New Buddha Way Dhamma Talks. Jeff Hunt presents a talk on some aspect of the Buddha's teaching. Right, well, good morning, everyone. Some of you were here last week, and you will remember that we started um, on the question of letting go. And to simplify things, I discussed five different ways of letting go. Um, there, are, there are more than five, there are more than 10, there are more than 500, but I've added another five in terms of one, two, three, is just to make things simpler, okay? We need actually to develop a, uh, an autonomous mind, one that goes where uh, it needs to go and not where it's being dragged by some timetable. Anyway, just to remind you, um, we did speak of letting go and five ways of doing that last week. And if you missed it, it's now on YouTube. And today's talk, which will be the other five, taking you up to 10 ways of letting go, will also be on YouTube uh, in the next few days. So do have a look because if you miss it here, or if, if you think you misunderstood something, or you did misunderstand something, or maybe I didn't express something very clearly, then that's your chance to go back to it and perhaps raise a question through uh, an email. Uh, we can discuss it further. Well, just a very quick reminder of the previous five ways of letting go. One was uh, substitution, or that, that is, I use the metaphor of using a carpenter's peg to push out an old peg. What this means is that something bad, if something you notice that something depressing, worrying is arising in the mind, that's an unpleasant question is being asked. Now, we're not trying to kill off our thoughts, but we are trying to live with them. So, the first one was using a good thought to push out a bad thought. Now, I won't run through all that again, I'll soon run out of time. The second one was assuming a little bit more time for contemplation. I can consider the consequences for myself and others of persevering with this thought or this feeling. That everything I say and do does have consequences. Sometimes one word can kill somebody. So words are powerful. So when, you know, thoughts of, well, it could be anything negative, from, from jealousy to um, wanting to harm somebody, wanting to put somebody in their place, whatever. So many other things that we can think of as negative. What is negative? By negative, we mean harmful in some way to myself and others, as opposed to good thoughts, which are helpful. So if the consequences of persevering with that thought arise, then you'll realize that Everything has consequences. So be very careful. <laughs> Think about what you're going to say or do next, which is pretty obvious really, but we're not generally very aware of this. The third one was shifting our attention. So we, it's like, again, a metaphor. We see something, our eyes are attracted to it, and then we think, no. I don't have to look at that. And my eyes turn away to something else. Um, now we can do the same thing with the mind. The mind is shifting its attention, like shutting the eyes or looking elsewhere. If you see something unpleasant on the um, pavement, the sidewalk, um, you probably won't let your eyes linger on it very long because you feel some disgust. But you see, you can shift your attention very quickly when you want to. So we're going to master that ability to just very simply shift your attention elsewhere. You can do it. It's just a question of making a beneficial habit out of it. Uh, the fourth one was what I just called, 
well, we call it relaxation, but it's that we're often in a permanent state or semi-permanent state of tension. So the Buddha gives the example of, I'm walking, but I'm walking very quickly. Then I ask myself, why am I walking so quickly? Is there any reason for it? Why don't I slow down? The quick walking is actually a manifestation of my tension or my anxiety that I have my destination in mind. I want to get there or whatever. So when you become aware that you're not relaxed, that there's tension, then you can let it go. For example, just slow down your walking or whatever it is that you're doing. Finally, uh, as a last resort, we can use a bit more mental force to push down a bad thought that is arising, especially if it's one that really would cause a lot of harm to yourself or to others. So that's subduing, but this is the last resort as we mentioned last time. Okay, so um, there are five. Yeah, I, th I think you can see straight away that they're all interrelated and overlapping. But let's go look at another five. So number six, <clears throat> what I just called just say no, which was a phrase used I know with drug addiction. But um, just say no means when somebody's offering something that, that really is going to be bad for you and others, then just all you've got to do is say no to it. But again, this is more general advice for all the little addictions we have to harmful thoughts or feelings. Just say no to it. It does not belong to you. Let it go. So just say no. Now, it's interesting that, and I think you'll all be aware of this, that the mind tends to be very busy because it's constantly solving problems or thinks that it is and thinks that if it doesn't solve problems constantly, it's going to fall into some sort of deep hole. So it keeps going, keeps going, reasoning with things. Now there's nothing wrong with reasoning up to a point. A point is reached where it's counterproductive, it's harmful, and it doesn't get you anywhere. And reasoning is actually not appropriate. That's not the problem. Very often there is no solution or resolution to an issue that can come through reasoning about it. One has to change one's attitude. The change of attitude, not something that I can resolve by reasoning through it. So when I know that, I realize that I'm too attached to reasoning. I somehow believe that if I think hard enough about this, I will find a solution. Well, it's possible that you will, but on the other hand, it's more likely that you'll just exhaust yourself or stop yourself sleeping. I think we've all had that experience of lying there till three o'clock in the morning thinking through something and thinking you know if I think hard enough I'll find a solution. <laughs> no you won't. She would just stay awake until three o'clock and feel thoroughly miserable. So don't put that much faith in reasoning. Reasoning, reasoning has got its place. We are reasoning creatures but not everything is resolved or solved by reasoning. Sometimes you need an, uh, another approach, a sort of curved ball that comes around and deals with the issue from the side. Okay, that's number six. Number seven, they're not in any particular order. Bod bodily intervention, which means that, you know, sometimes one is sitting about feeling um, resentment, for example, uh, about something, feeling hurt about something. Um, and something just keeps coming up, coming up, and you try to reason through it and it doesn't get you anywhere. Well, the body can give your mind a bit of a shock sometimes. You know, just instead of sitting there or lying there, get up. <laughs> um, and that will break the worry chain, as I call it. For example, if say, say you were lying in bed and you're thinking about something over and over and it's stopping you, stopping you sleeping. Well, get out of the bed, go down to the kitchen, give yourself a glass of water, uh, perhaps read a little poetry, perhaps read some of the sayings of the Buddha in the Dhammapada, uh, perhaps look at some pleasant photographs of, of I don't know, wild animals or birds or flowers or whatever, and you'll find that the mind is then diverting onto another track. 
And somehow it seems to say it's to itself, why, why am I so worried about that? Why, am I, why don't I just, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm overlooking here, pleasant things. So bodily intervention means just getting up and doing something. You know, if I get into such a state or I can see it coming, or very often I'm lucky enough to have a garden, so I'll pop out into the garden and potter about, pulling out some weeds or planting some things uh, that will look nice or um, give me some thought about what is a weed? Are there any things, really things called weeds? So uh, you see, my mind has now gone off on another track. So I've quite, quite forgotten. My body has pushed my mind off into a different direction. I think you've all had this um, uh, experience where you go upstairs to get something. By the time you get to the top of the stairs, you've forgotten what it was. There's a lesson there. There's a very important lesson there. It's telling you that bodily intervention will take you off that worrisome track. Okay, so I'm, I'm not saying we should all work on forgetting what's at the top of the stairs. What I'm saying, the fact that that happens shows us that the body can intervene and stop the mind doing what it's doing. Well, just try it. Okay, number eight, impermanence. It's quite good just to remember the teaching on impermanence, that every darn thing is on the move. It's, it's either growing or changing or it's disintegrating. And that applies to human life as well. Now, there is nothing we can do about that. That is a fact of life. So we just need to accept it gracefully. Um, I know there are issues about, you know, will I be annihilated? Will I die? What is, happens when I die? It's like all of the, we'll come back to that on, an, on another, another occasion. Um, but if you remember that whatever mood I'm in or whatever problem I'm trying to solve at the moment, one day it will mean nothing to you, almost certainly. Some of the things I worried about in the past, which kept me awake at night, I can't even remember what they were. I have no idea what they were. If you asked me to make a list, I'd probably only come up with three different things, which were, you know, at the time I regarded as some of the calamities of my life. In truth, some of the things I saw as calamities at the time <clears throat> turned out to be really good moves on my part. <laughs> I didn't know why, and I didn't know how things were going to change, you see. so. I may think that this is a calamity, but later on, with a broader perspective, I see that it wasn't a calamity, it was an opportunity. So just keep in mind, whatever mood you're in, this will pass. Just say to yourself, this mood or this thought will pass. One day I will just look back on it and think, that was a waste of time, wasn't it? Okay, number nine, now number nine is quite uh, important. Uh, there is the risk of a misunderstanding about what we're doing here. We are not trying to stop uh, harmful thoughts arising in the first place. You cannot do that. Harmful thoughts arise. You don't decide first, I'm going to have a harmful thought, and then you have a harmful thought. That doesn't make any sense. It just arises. So we are not failing if harmful thoughts arise. No, that, that is normal, that is natural. Harmful thoughts will arise. This is Buddha's teaching and uh, right effort, that there are things which are harmful, which are unarisen, but they, they, they may arise. So don't think that, that what we're, this teaching is about is stopping you thinking harmful thoughts. It's what you do to mitigate it once it has started. It must, that must, must be what it means. Now, it's never too late. So if you start having a harmful or negative thought, you may think, oh, there I go again. Oh, I failed again. I can't do that. I can't do what Jeff teaches me. Jeff didn't teach you to try to stop things arising. Jeff is teaching you <laughs> what to do about it once they are arising. Now, the earlier you can catch it, the better, and you get better at it. It's like fishing or some other blood sports. The quicker you get there, 
um, the quicker you will catch catch a fish or you'll catch whatever you're after. So you become quite um, adept at spotting in yourself this is awareness that something unpleasant is arising. Now, if you're very quick, you can say this, you can always say to yourself, no, 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 don't want you to go away and just shift your mind onto something else. It does work. And the more you do it, the quicker you get at it. The mind is becoming more and more agile. You need agility of mind here. It need, things move quickly in the mind or they can get, things can get entrenched in the mind and refuse to budge. But we're beginning to understand its ways. It's a bit sticky, it's a bit gluey. It has to be because it does have to stick to some things like if I have to eat, I have to eat. And when I don't eat, well, you know, it becomes a problem. Um, so the mind has a kind of stickiness or adhesiveness about it. That's okay, that's normal, but it will tend to stick to things which are harmful to it as well. So we've got to watch our own minds and see that's not going in the right direction, not in a fruitful direction in any way. And, uh, but this one would, this, this idea or thought does go in a fruitful way. I'll do something about it, whatever it is. Call somebody on the phone that you need to say something to or whatever it is. Okay. So uh, we are, the word mitigation is quite, you know, people like lawyers like to use mitigation. To mitigate something is to, is to soften it or to move it, you know, a bit from unpleasant to, to acceptable or even pleasant. You're mitigate, mitigating the harm. Well, I don't think this is used much in Buddhism, and that's because people get stuck in following certain rules and uh, doctrines, but um, mitigation is very often what the advice about dealing with um, destructive thoughts is, is about. It's mitigating it, it's not trying to destroy it. it in fact, it would be silly to destroy it because you could learn something from it. So it will arise, you can't stop it arising, that's futile. What you're doing is mitigating when it does arise. And it may arise and you become so adept at this that you can spot that pretty, pretty damn quick. Of course, the opposite is you don't notice what is happening. You don't notice that your mind is now getting pretty thoroughly glued to this idea. And tossing and turning in bed or whatever it is. And, or you may be driving down the motorway at 70 miles an hour and you're having these thoughts. That's pretty dangerous. Um, and it, would get, it, could get, it could just get worse and worse until you feel something called despair. Despair. Despair means no hope. I'm giving up hope. <laughs> Look, you've got all the apparatus you need to, to mitigate. You know, it's just a question of using that, that toolbox. If you don't use the toolbox, then, you know, the, the tools are going to just start rusting there and serve no purpose. Take the tools out of the box. Here's the toolbox, right? Start using them and keep on using them. And you become very adept at using them until it becomes a kind of different you. You know, you become calmer and wiser. Of course, you sometimes get things wrong. Who doesn't? We're all human beings. Again, don't blame yourself when that happens. Instead, do something about it. Recognize it, acknowledge it, and learn uh, how it can be turned in one way or another. So, people often say to me, and it's one of the most common things that people say, is that I, know, I do notice that, or I do acknowledge that I'm having a bad thought. But then it's too late, you know, it's already, it's already the bar. It, there's no such thing as too late. It doesn't matter if it, you're two seconds into it or two hours into it. Wherever you have realized that this, is, this thought is making me miserable, that's the time to say, no, no, you don't. It's, why am I holding on to this thought? Now, these are all methods you can develop. But the next point is that um, 
you have to develop, this is a training, so you can't expect it to work first time around. We are so lazy now in the Western world. If we haven't got a quick fix for something, then it's not worth having. And yet, in fact, the truth is, it's the other way around. If it's a quick fix, you should be very suspicious of it. Everything worth having takes time and effort, but it's really worthwhile because you're coming a, a, a wiser person, a better person, a person that's enjoying life more than being trapped in this little prison of worry. That's sad. Now, finally, um, number 10. The number nine was never too late. Number 10, forgiveness. Now, this is a big topic. Very often, the reason that we, this keeps coming back into my head is a feeling of resentment. We have to be honest with it. Who doesn't feel resentment? I have. Who hasn't? Is there any person on this planet who hasn't felt resentment against another person, a group or an organization? And resentment is what? Is a feeling of uh, you cheated me, you damaged my reputation, you've um, not given me what I deserve, I deserve better than that, uh, so I dislike you, I hate you, I'd like to hurt you, but I don't know how to do it without anybody knowing about it. No, this is really dangerous stuff, actually. There should be much more talk about resentment. Go, 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 go and work in a prison for a while and see how many people are feeling. The reason they got into trouble was, was part, very often, not always, but very often, is through acting on powerful resentment. Resentment is burning your insides. You are allowing it to burn your insides and you will feel worse and worse. There is no solution there. Reason cannot provide any solution. Something has to happen in, within you, which is a change of attitude. And we can call that attitude forgiveness. Now, how do you forgive somebody? That somebody, somebody perhaps who has willfully let you down or willfully cheated you. You, you can spend the rest of your life dwelling on that if you like, but you'll be miserable. It's best to let it go. Now, how do you let it go? People, of course, so this is a big, people ask me about this, but it's a, big, it's a big topic. If I turn it around and I think this person who has hurt me or let me down, you know, they had a life. Uh, they were once children. They were brought up in a family. I don't know how they were treated in that family. They've learned certain patterns of reacting to certain situations. Some of that is not very productive. Some of it's harmful to others. People who are harmed a lot in childhood become harmers because they're still reliving the past and they think that's the way you get on in life because it's, that is what their experience of life was. So they continue. Now, when I start to see not a person as that person um, affects me, but how that person has been shaped, has been conditioned by all the conditions of their own life and they've resu they resulted in harmful behavior and on this occasion I got harmed. Now I hate them. Well, hatred can spread like wildfire. We can all do that all around the planet. It won't do us any good at all. It will destroy us. All the greatest teachers say that, you know, forgiveness is the only way. In my study, I have a picture of the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. <laughs> standing together, smiling at each other face to face. This is a wonderful photograph because here are two people that talk a lot about forgiveness. Because Desmond Tutu stopped a complete uh, massacre really in, in South Africa by saying, uh, horrendous as this has been for the we people here in South Africa, we have to let go and forgive so we can move on. And they listened to him. Because it was set up for a real civil war is coming. It's still got its difficulties, of course. So forgiveness. Try to see, what I'm trying to say, try to, if you're thinking of a particular person or what they've done to you, um, don't think of that person as the person that related to you at a particular time. Think of them as a person who's had a life, 
Maybe you don't know what that higher life was like. They're a whole person. They were a baby once. They will also get old and die. We're all in the same boat. So I will forgive that person because we're all alike. Whatever that person is doing to me, I might be tempted to do it to others myself. So I will forgive. I will let you go. You know, once you do that, it's like taking wing, like, on, like a dove flying out from the cage. Suddenly relief. Suddenly you're falling asleep or feeling better. So those who taught forgiveness is the only way were saying something very important. Okay, finally, if I'm allowed just one or two minutes, besides specific remedies, because this is what we're looking for remedies, there's the whole, what we might call background conditions. We know that if I'm tired, I'm more likely to be snapping at somebody. So tiredness is the background condition. Right, there are lots of background conditions which I should work on. And that is, by changing these conditions, I, I am less likely to have intrusive negative thoughts. But con good conditions facilitate a peaceful mind. A peaceful mind doesn't need to do all this paraphernalia, all these uh, different remedies for disruptive thoughts. One, do not expect immediate results. You've got to work on it. I'm sorry, there is no quick fix. Results will be gradual and cumulative. It's not like I've taught you this now, you're going to do it once and then everything's going to be wonderful. No. It's like being, uh, being an athlete. Whenever did an athlete, when was an athlete told, this is how you run fast and then they get up, run fast and then they can do it. It doesn't work like that. They got to keep on running fast. They got to keep on running faster, right? I mean, that's not a very good metaphor, but the point is you've got to keep on with, with, with doing this until it becomes part of who you are. Regularity of meditation is good. We meditate because it's bringing the whole background feeling that we have to a level in which bad thoughts don't arise. This is the development again of mental agility that the mind can move around through awareness and see where it's going. We have gone there already, but you know, <laughs> it's never too late to do something about it. Then there's the support of a Sangha or community or, 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 and of a Kalyana Mitata, which is that as a, a, a spiritual friend with friends you may make within, within the Sangha. Now, Sangha is a community. Now, isn't it a refreshing thing when we are all here together talking about something of importance to us that we cannot find this kind of discussion anywhere else? It's certainly not in the educational system for some reason. You're more likely to teach you algebra, which I can't say has been the most useful thing I ever learned in my life, but this would have been useful. It's a wonderful thing. So the community is, is, is self-supporting talk to each other. Finally, I uh, really I mean finally, you know, we do tend to forget what we're eating and how what we're eating makes a difference to how we feel. It's a big, a big difference. I mean, we may not think about it. We may just eat what we think we like. What you like may be destroying you for all you know. Anything with caffeine in it before you go to bed is probably for most people not a good idea. I won't take anything with caffeine in it now, but when I, even when I stopped, uh, uh, what I did was no caffeine, you know, no tea, no coffee uh, after 6, 6 p.m. Because I, I noticed, you said, put two and two together, that the caffeine was keeping me awake. But what I didn't realize was chocolate. The darker the chocolate is, the more caffeine it has in it. So sitting in front of the TV at, you know, sort of 10 o'clock, popping chocolate in your mouth. It may, not for everybody, but it may actually keep you awake right, when those intrusive little thoughts will pop up. So, you know, do, do an experiment, see whether the chocolate behaves like you eat the chocolate, but just not before you go to sleep. Alcohol. Alcohol will at first make you sleepy, but over the longer run, it will destroy your deep sleep. 
who's still asleep, but it, what, the deep sleep. Uh, ha have a look on the internet, alcohol and sleep. That it will, first of all, kind of knock you back. You know, oh, I've been feeling drowsy you now. This is just what I want. But over time, it's destroying your capacity to go into deep sleep, which is what the body and mind really needs. Okay, so I think we really need a booklet for this, don't we? There's quite a lot there. But anyway, I'm quite interested to hear what uh, questions or remarks you have to make. So thank you very much for listening. New Buddha way lets go of east and west and starts afresh in the life we have now. For more information, visit www.newbuddhaway.org.